We're blessed to be on the campus of the St. Constantine School here in Houston, Texas, together uh, with leadership from the school, Dr. John Mark Reynolds. It's our privilege and our blessing to be able to be here together with you, and thank you for the opportunity Thanks. to be able to learn more about you and the beautiful school that you have it, here. It really is my honor. We're a pan-Orthodox school. Uh, we serve the Orthodox community of Houston, but we also were founded uh, with national scope. So we hope uh, in the next two or three years to begin starting other schools both around Houston as our home community, around Texas, and also in other states. So it's really exciting to get the word out that Orthodox people can be leaders in both K through 12 and college education in the United States. Uh, Greek uh, speakers have always led in education. Everybody who does education in the United States owes an infinite debt to Greece. The type of education that we do, uh, everyone should be a philhellene that's involved in education because the debt uh, to Greece, to historic Greece, and to Christian Greece, which sometimes is forgotten in terms of education, is vast. So it's really good to have you here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I. I Obviously, we want to be able to dive in to learn more about the school here and, and all the wonderful things that are taking place. But before we get to that, I'd love to learn just a little bit more about you. Oh. Could you please provide just a little bit of background about yourself personally and also educationally? Yeah, it, it's uh, I because I'm from Virginia, West Virginia, you always start with when you came <clears throat> and your family because my family uh, comes first in my thinking. But my family came to the United States in about the 1620s to Jamestown. And we're the side of the Reynolds family that didn't uh, plant tobacco and become fabulously wealthy. Uh, we moved into Western Virginia and became uh, unimportant but good people, uh, mountain people, uh, eventually in the state of West Virginia. And so I have a wonderful dad and mom who are here in Houston with me. Dad's 83, uh, still gives me warm counsel and advice. Uh, I'm married uh, to uh, beautiful wife, Hope Elpida. Uh, you know, and so she is so uh, central to what we do here as first lady. Uh, and then I have four adult children that we homeschooled because we didn't have the school yet, uh, K through 12. My background is in higher education. So I did a PhD, uh, MA and PhD in Plato uh, at the University of Rochester in the philosophy department. So I have a philosophy degree in an analytic department, which just means I'm exceedingly boring. So if you fall asleep in the middle of this, that's why. <laughs> it also means uh, that you make no money uh, over the course of your life because that's philosophy. Uh, but you do get to teach hundreds of wonderful students. So after I finished my PhD, I got the opportunity to start what is now one of the largest gifted and talented honors colleges in the United States, the Tory Honors College. It was the Tory Honors Institute. It's now the Tory Honors College. Well over 400 students by the time I left eight years ago. Uh, they've continued to go on and do awesome things, but it meant that I spent uh, two decades nearly teaching some of the most gifted and talented students in a classical Hellenic uh, Christian context uh, at an evangelical college, Biola University. Uh, and so I did that uh, for a long time, but that meant I developed a long Facebook page full of wonderful students who were interested in the kind of education that they had received and doing it. I moved to Houston because we began to think about the project that you're now sitting in the middle of. It's had different names. Uh, over the course of time, and I came to be the chief academic officer, the provost for Houston Baptist University, which is about two miles down the street. Wonderful place. Uh, while I was there, I uh, helped start a film program with some former students who are still there. Uh, the Honors College was already there, uh, but we provided some new faculty and some new focus, and I hope, you know, brought them along in a good way. Uh, worked hard to form an apologetics program because we live in a time when Christian values, the kind of values uh, that our church supports, are under attack. And so how can we learn to not be defensive about the faith, but to defend the faith, explain it in such a way that people are drawn to the true light and they come and see and experience uh, what orthodoxy offers, what Christianity offers. So I did that for three years. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to be a conventional college president, which would be the normal thing for someone on my career trajectory to do. But unfortunately for me, I'd had this idea that what we should do is have college with no debt. 
could we have an Oxford-style education, the kind of education that I told you the Reynoldses have been in North America in what's now the United States for almost 400 years, and the most education that was ever offered to us was up to about eighth grade. You know, my dad was the first person to get to go to high school, and then he went to college and grad school, leaving nothing for any of the rest of us to do, no accomplishments. Uh, and, and yet, it wasn't the same kind of education that rich people gave to their kids. And so we began to think, was there a way to give an Oxford or Cambridge style education? Uh, we teach here often one-on-one, -on -one, just like we're talking now. Uh, you might bring in a paper and I would examine it. We would talk about it. Uh, we would work hard to help you read well, write well, think well, be numerate, understand the scientific method. That kind of generic college degree that most people get, uh, really. Most people don't work inside their major. You know, they get a job in sales or uh, doing something else. Uh, could we do that for people and get rid of all debt? Well, to do that, we had to get rid of all administration because that's, that's really what's cost so much money, why the, the cost of college uh, has skyrocketed. Professors aren't getting rich, I can assure you, and are not overpaid. Many of them now are just part-time and barely, no benefits, barely getting by. Uh, and so we began to work on that. Uh, and work on integrating that with K through 12. Those two things had never been meant to uh, feed into each other. Like I'm gonna go to 12 years of school, now we had kindergarten, now I go to college, it's 16 years. It's very repetitive often, very inefficient, very expensive. And so uh, I had been talking about that for a long time and a very generous group of uh, priests and donors came right as I was about to move out of Texas uh, to work on a more traditional college project and said, well, you've talked about this all the time. Uh, we want an Orthodox school, an Orthodox program. Put your money where your mouth is, or at least your life, and we'll give you the money uh, to do the project. And so the St. Constantine School was born uh, to provide uh, classical, Christian, Hellenic education that first begins by thinking about what does a good college education look like? So we have a small, fully accredited, regionally accredited, which is the best accreditation you can have, college program. And then when we were done with that, we said, okay, what kind of high school students do we want coming into the college program? And how can we get rid of the waste and repetition from high school to college? And so we started a high school that had lots of dual enrollment classes that you can transfer. We've had students leave our high school here and go to Rice, Texas A&M, uh, Baylor, the University of Texas, uh, you know, many, all our students go to college. Some stay here, one or two in any graduating class. Most go out to very good colleges all over the state of Texas. Texas kids tend to stay in Texas uh, for college. It's Republic of Texas, what can I tell you? Uh, and that was just a wonderful opportunity to do that. And then we started thinking, well, how do we have kids come to high school and not be burned out? Uh, what should K through eight look like if we already had college in mind? And so we designed a K through eight program that's very innovative, that deals with outside play, that in some ways takes the academic pressure off in certain areas, like excessive homework, and puts it on improper areas, like writing well, communicating well. Uh, and then the opportunity to start from scratch meant that I was able to turn around a lot of the academic leadership that I had worked with at the fine university down the street, wonderful place. Uh, if you want to become a nurse, that's the place you should go uh, here in this area, for example. But a lot of that leadership came with me to start the school. And then, of course, I was able to hire in an initial <coughs> wave just uh, many of these former gifted and talented college students. So in some ways, my biography feeds into why the school was able to start in a very mature way. Even in our first year here on this site, people thought of us as, well, how long have you been here? If you've been here 10 years, are you 15 years old? How come we haven't heard of you? So we're coming to the end of our fifth year of operation. We just had graduation uh, last Saturday. And by God's good grace, uh, this fall, we'll have about 360 students registered from uh, kindergarten three, three-year-olds in kindergarten, all the way through senior year of college. So we're very excited about that. We're growing very slowly, intentionally. We could flood the zone and become big fast, but we want to keep the quality up uh, in the project. So that's a little bit about me, maybe more than you ever wanted to hear, but how it feeds into the project, the thing we're doing 
uh, the biography of knowing what it is I wish my grandfather had been able to do schooling wise. Uh, the other thing is school is often a set of hoops where you say, why am I doing this? What does this have to do with real life? And again, if the focus is on reading well, readers lead and the ability to read something complicated. To, if you can read and discuss Plato's Republic, then the HR manual is no problem for you. If you can negotiate a first-rate discussion and learn the discussion skills with someone who's arguing with you about an important thing, something you feel passionately about, then the corporate boardroom, when you're sitting and having a big discussion, uh, is easy for you. I've had students uh, that leave a nursing program, for example, uh, and become the head nurse on their, on their floor because she can sit down and negotiate with people correctly because she had four years of experience with people, you know, not her best friends, uh, talking about some of the deepest ideas, the deepest things of God, uh, and learning to do that. And so I have former students, uh, three Baylor professors, uh, for those who are in Texas, but students all over the world in education, the military, uh, industry, opera singer, uh, really diverse kind of uh, education that comes out of reading well, writing well, thinking well, and being deeply numerate, understanding the scientific method. Now, if you want to become a nurse, you want to become an engineer, there are very fine programs in Texas, in the United States, that can help you do that. And so we can give you two years of college schooling, or many of our high school students will leave us with one year of college just by going uh, to the school here and transfer to other schools because they have a specific job in mind when they get out. Uh, but we're really trying to design all the way down to the smallest kids with the Catechism of the Good Shepherd to install a love of the church. Uh, though 80% of our students aren't Orthodox, they all go to chapel every day. Uh, if they're small, they all go through the Catechism of the Good Shepherd. They learn the Creed. They learn to say morning and evening prayers. Uh, they will go uh, to uh, liturgy. We have about three times a year here, and they'll experience that. Of course, if they're not Orthodox, uh, they don't commune, uh, but they still are part of that. And so we do sometimes and often see converts uh, come out of a program like this. But we're really here to serve the whole city of Houston and then ultimately the United States. So listening to you speak about <clears throat> the different experiential elements of the St. Constantine School right. really truly resonates that what you're doing is engaging and helping to cultivate and develop a holistic person. Yeah, an odd thing we do here is um, we're a very urban campus on purpose. So Houston, if people don't understand, is probably at this point the third largest city in the United States. Maybe Chicago, uh, no one's quite sure. Uh, but it's growing very quickly and Chicago isn't. So soon we'll be the third largest city in the U.S. And we put ourselves intentionally between the two loops uh, that gird downtown. Uh, so we're in the city, but we also have stayed intentionally green on our campus so that we have a garden. All of our K-6 through students garden as a central part of what they do. They learn where their food comes from. We keep two sheep on campus during the year, which I suppose is a lot of fun on one level, kids love it, uh, parents love it, the college students love being able to write shepherd. Went to college in Houston, my college job was being a shepherd. Uh, it's unusual, I'm not sure how practical that is. It's better to work with the accounting department really, but, <laughs> but the men fight over who's going to be the shepherd on the list. One thing that you spoke about uh, engaging and cultivating the skills in the students, about teaching children how to think. Yes. Could you please elaborate on that thought specifically on how that's developed within a classical educational model perhaps even beginning with some of the basic tenets we hear that terminology at times classical education model sometimes referred to as Socratic or Jeffersonian could you please elaborate on what that model is and how it really cultivates a thinking individual I it's really useful to think about Socratic education uh, because it gets to asking you a question, letting you think through your thoughts. But I really wish they'd call the kind of education at its <clears throat> best that is done in the United States or at St. Constantine as St. Basil's education. Because really, if uh, when I was able to do this project, we wanted to do a truly orthodox school. And what would a truly orthodox school look like? Uh, it wouldn't look exactly like, and this is, you know, many, many Roman Catholic students come to the school, but it wouldn't look the same as the parish school model, because if you look at Eastern schools, 
uh, they were involved in what we might call secular education. They were deeply orthodox, but the emperor might have paid for them, or the local region, or some patron in the town. And St. Basil was quite eager to send young men to study Homer and Plato and Aristotle inside a Christian context, because that forces you to ask questions, why do I believe what I believe? So uh, an Orthodox school, a Hellenic school, is not catechism. That occurs at church. It ought to occur at church. It better occur at church. Now, we memorize and talk about the creed. We explore it. We examine what it is. But at every point, we try to help our children, even when they're three years old, begin to speak for themselves. What do you see here? What is the truth here? Can we expose you to God in the person of Jesus Christ for yourself as you think for yourself? And this includes secular issues. You know, why talk about science? Let's go do science. Uh, why talk about biology? Let's go to the garden and experience that with younger kids. And so uh, a St. Basil's education uh, doesn't leave church things to the church. That's a false separation. But it says we're not the church. We're instead a way of engaging with the best of classical learning, in his case, and we do that too, uh, but the best of contemporary secular education and the worst. So by the time you graduate from high school here, uh, it's safe to say here in Houston that we're not Marxists, but we'll have had our high school students or and our college students wrestle with Marxism by reading Marx and reading Lenin and struggling through with that. And we don't just tell them what's wrong with it uh, because this doesn't work. Uh, we all know uh, that in a young adult or a high school student, that if you tell them what to think, they'll immediately want to take the other point of view. Uh, they'll resist. Uh, instead, we'll have them look at the ideas and tease out what those ideas are. Uh, we'll read a prominent atheist uh, like Graham Oppie, who's maybe the best writer uh, for the atheist team, uh, and we'll work through his work respectfully, but then we'll push kids to say, okay, what do you make of that? If you go to another college or you get on in the workplace, no one's going to say anything more difficult than this. This is the most difficult thing they could say. Can we help you work through it? Now, make no mistake, if you want to come into my office and have a one-on-one -on -one with me or with any of the faculty here and say, uh, what's the church's view on a hot button issue, uh, like the right to life? Oh, we'll tell you and we'll give you uh, reasons why we think those are true. So we're not ashamed of that. But inside the classroom, <clears throat> this um, St. Basil or Socratic method uh, is really helping you examine your own beliefs for yourself. And then, of course, we hope that you're going to a good parish, that you're keeping the feasts. Uh, we'll help you do that by reminding you. But we're not a substitute for parish life. Uh, we hope that we're pushing you into parish life and causing uh, people who aren't Orthodox to become deeply committed uh, to their own church communities. But also come and see, you know, come and see what's going on at a church like St. Basil's. So it sounds like from discussing many of the offerings here for your students, what many would consider extracurricular activities are central. ingrained and central yeah. in the program here, uh, specifically when it comes to the sciences, as you spoke about, sheep, right. gardening, so right. on and so forth. Uh, what about other more traditionally understood extracurricular activities? How are those being offered here at the St. Constantine School? And what do you envision as expansion of that as well? Well, at 360, we're not likely to win a state basketball championship this year. But uh, we try, you know. It's, <laughs> we're not going to not win it if we could win it. But no, uh, sports are good. Uh, they're part of this same classical model. Uh, we can't do chariot racing in Constantinople, but uh, we do the best we can uh, with field days and things like that that are kind of intramural uh, that everyone participates in. Uh, and that means everyone, is it college students participate in. So we're a broad community. In one way, a way to think about a classical Hellenic school is that we're teacher and parent centered, we hope, COVID has made this hard. Uh, we're coming out of that pandemic here. It's in our rear view mirror, God willing. Uh, we're teacher and parent centered because that's the community that goes on. In a classical school, graduation was about the school. And so we invite students to participate in band, but we might have parents that play in the band. Uh, we surely would have teachers that play in the band because the band will go on and we're inviting you to join our community. If you're a graduate and you live in the area, keep playing in the band if you can take time off you know, during your work day. 
So we have band, we have instrumental music here, we have choir, uh, we have sports programs. Uh, now in the sports programs, because high school kids could, should compete, high school boys should compete with high school boys, those are limited in the ways that people would understand traditional co-curricular or athletic teams to go. Uh, very character-centered, uh, like any school. So if you can name a club, chess club, uh, we're likely to have it, uh, including wonderful. crazy, there's a Star Trek club of all things. I would have thought that was so long ago uh, that no one would be doing a Star Trek club, but there is one on this campus. And so uh, it's an unusual place. We have a diversity of students. Houston is probably the most diverse city in the United States, and our student body reflects Houston. So it's a wonderful urban, in the city, not afraid of anything, but also not afraid to be really orthodox and really be Hellenic. Now, again, uh, if you're an atheist and you decide to send your kids here, you really get the pervasively Christian thing fast because we're not going to hide anything from you. Your kid's going to come to morning prayers like everyone else, and it has an effect. I don't, if I were two atheist parents, I don't know why I would send my kids here, but <coughs> this kind of education is good, it works. Uh, and so people do, uh, but we don't change anything. Uh, I think for Christian parents, they sometimes think a Christian education is Sunday school. Uh, no, a Sunday school is for Sundays, and we need strong Sunday school programs uh, inside our parishes because they're doing work that supplements the work that we're doing. Uh, they're providing the other side of what St. Basil would describe as an orthodox uh, life education. Uh, it doesn't take a village to raise a child in one sense of that phrase that's been misused, but in another sense, we need churches, we need schools, we need hospitality centers, uh, we need uh, hospitals uh, in the traditional sense of the word. These are all natural parts of the Orthodox life, and the school has its task, task to perform. And we can look at Constantinople, where uh, basically in an almost uninterrupted thousand years, uh, there was law, philosophy, medical science that was continuously done in the orthodox ethos, ethos, tradition, but not controlled by the church. Uh, happy with the church, compatible with the church, but, you know, doing its thing. Uh, I, I like to say this, the eagle has two heads at our school. Uh, and in some ways, it's often a very wonderful symbol of how this sort of thing works. The school is helping the church, the church is helping the school, but it's one body in the life of a student. Beautiful. You spoke at the beginning about how those involved in education, especially in areas seated in Western civilization, have to all understand ourselves as Philhellenes. Yes. In one it, extent or another. Yes, in, <laughs> that's absolutely true. In, in keeping with that, um, could you please speak a little bit about the, the language offerings that you have here at the school and how that's a part of, of what's taking place right. and how it helps to develop the holistic person? Well, that's right. And, and let me say, and this is too little known, that, of course, I mean, there's a kind <clears throat> of view in certain Western countries uh, that Constantinople fell and so the Renaissance was born because people got manuscripts. But, of course, that ignores hundreds of years of Eastern influence and in education in places like Florence and Ravenna, uh, the deep educational work uh, that turned into things like the University of Paris and then Oxford and Cambridge mm -hmm. that flowed from the East naturally, organically, over hundreds of years. And, and then, you know, when people went into exile, this was jump-started in an important way. But the Greek nature of what we're doing, the fusion of Athens and Jerusalem when they came together in someone like St. Basil uh, is unsurpassed. I mean, everyone imitates it to some degree or another. Uh, and sometimes I think the Greeks should sue Oxford uh, and ask for royalties uh, for the style of education uh, since it came from Constantinople and spread. Now, of course, it's developed. We've learned a thing or two uh, over centuries because the education does that uh, for people. So everyone has to be a Phil Helene because the roots of what we do go back to uh, you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers, all the way through Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, as everyone knows all too well, but often forgotten. You know, uh, Aristotle and Alexander didn't die, and then the Greeks took a vacation 
from inventing ideas and developing education. So both through the Hellenistic period and then especially when Paul came to Mars Hill and in Acts 17 instituted uh, Christian education on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17. And then uh, great thinkers, uh, whether it's Justin Martyr early on or others, begin to pick this up. Greek was the language of education. Uh, to not know Greek was to not be educated. So we're a school, though we're run by Philhellenes. Uh, uh, we're not, uh, you know, Greeks ourselves, most of us. Uh, we start with Greek at a very early age, and you could work in Greek or on Greek uh, right through 12th grade. And about 10% of our curriculum is directly de derived from the Hellenic tradition. Uh, we celebrated Greek Bicentennial here uh, as a result, and we'll continue uh, to do that over this Greek Bicentennial period. Um, all the great languages are goal of the Orthodox Church, including English, uh, I hope. Uh, it's considered are taught here, but we have a real focus right now on Arabic. Uh, so we're one of the few places, at least in Texas, maybe the United States, where you have an Orthodox orientation toward the Arabic that's taught, which very often does not have a Christian orientation. The Arabic that's taught in our colleges, there are very few high schools that teach Arabic, but we do. You can take Arabic here. Uh, we have a strong emphasis on Spanish because, of course, we live in Texas, and that's a second language uh, for a lot of people here, or their primary language for a lot of our students. Um, when we have enough people, we offer French uh, because of some of the Lebanese roots uh, of our community. Uh, right now, uh, French isn't active or small, uh, and we have the ambition of teaching Russian uh, as soon as we can in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, because of the area that we live in and the way the world is, uh, the way languages have become. So language study, I'm glad you asked this, very important to what we do. And the United States is an imperial power, and we don't like to think of ourselves that way, but we're the most powerful country in the world, and people look to us. Um, we've gotten a little use in the last 50 years, 60 years, maybe after World War II, of not having to compete very hard, you know, maybe against the Soviet Union and the Cold War, but that kind of went away. And as a result, we've become very monolingual. You know, we expect people to learn English. We don't expect to learn any other language. And sadly, that was the way I was raised uh, and the way most Americans are raised. And so one thing we're trying to do, I guess if, if you didn't get an opportunity, you try to provide it for everyone else, is to say, look, the world is changing. I hope the United States, the Republic, stays strong and we stay a major power. Uh, I hope we stay uh, very powerful. But we also need to be able to compete. Uh, we need to be able to understand some of the languages of commerce and the languages of our faith. Uh, and so we'll work on that. Uh, any of the great Orthodox languages, uh, we would be happy to teach uh, if we find you know students who want to learn them. And we probably have a faculty member. We could offer Russian right now if someone wanted to take it uh, because we have someone who studied at the University of Moscow. Uh, so as we grow or as we develop other sites, we would expect more of that to go. But wherever we go, wherever we go, there will always be English and Greek because again, it's the language of the deepest literature we read. Uh, Homer, Plato, the New Testament, uh, the New Testament, I emphasize. You know, in one way we're a great book program. Uh, centered around the Bible. Uh, but these are all, you know, Greek is there. That's that's what it is. So that will be offered everywhere and then other languages as, as demanded. You spoke uh, about the ancient philosophers and you referenced Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle by saying that we all know too well. I would argue that, ah, unfortunately, oh, we well, don't okay. know too well. Yes. And if you come here, you'll have read the complete Plato we've become victim, before you graduate. We've become victim of a 15-minute Google search ah. uh, with self-proclaimed accolades of, of expertise. I guess so that's true. Thank God that there uh, are schools like this, or at least there's this school, to help instill that in young well, people. And, and I get asked a lot. Look, I have very practical business people who support this school. And if you're watching this and you're a very practical person, you would say, uh, why in the world would you read the complete Plato and wrestle with it and struggle with it? I'll tell you this, if you wrestle your way through the Republic, you are really going to be a keen thinker and be able to understand. People will give you uh, work-related problems and they'll seem simple to you. 
you'll have developed the mental flexibility to handle almost anything. I, here's, here's the problem that people fall into in education. And I, I really, I wanna to talk to people who want the most practical education. They could, I almost care less about spiritual formation. That's terrible, but let, let's assume that's true. Uh, they don't care about Hellenic culture. I think that's terrible, but uh, let's assume it's true. Suppose they only care about helping their kids get a good job. I want to say two things about that. First, most people change careers multiple times. When I look at the research, I get different numbers. I get numbers like seven or eight careers. So how do you expect a high school or a college program to prepare a student for seven or eight careers some of which will occur 40 years from now. Better to give person the basic toolkit to be able to think well in perennial issues, issues that always come up, that have been coming up for 1500 years since the time of Plato, because they'll develop the flexibility that when uh, in Rochester, New York, where I went to grad school, University of Rochester, everything revolved around the great yellow mother, Eastman Kodak. You ran a high school, you went to Eastman Kodak, they bought a full spread in your yearbook, and you had it made. Uh, high school graduates from the best high school in town, the Jesuit school, would graduate, go to work for the great yellow mother, you know, on whatever level, retire, and they'd have hundreds of thousands in the bank. It was a very paternalistic company. I don't have to tell anyone that Eastman Kodak is no more. I mean, the whole center of the city of Rochester was Kodak Park. It is now literally a park. Fortunately, Kodak destroyed its own factories, and it's a park. Uh, and there are a few hundred employees in Rochester, mostly archiving old patents mm. and mining them for work. So <clears throat> if you had been prepared when I went to high school in the city of Rochester for the jobs of the Rochester future, Xerox, Bosch & Lomb, and Kodak, uh, I'll leave all the practical people to look up what came of that. Uh, if I had been taught computer technology in that era, I, nothing I learned would be of the least value now. Fortunately, I went to a Christian school that taught me to read well, write well, think well, and be numerate, and so I was ready as things shifted, because here's the second point to make to a practical person. Uh, I graduated a very long time ago, in 1986. You know, dinosaurs walked the face of the earth. Uh, Go get a business magazine from 1986 and look at their predictions of what jobs I would have over the course of my life. And what you will see is if those people were any good at making those predictions, they wouldn't have told you because they'd be fabulously rich. They would have invested in some dude in his garage named Steve Jobs inventing Apple, beginning to develop Apple, doing the things that came out of that. Compare the Fortune 500 list in 1986 to the Fortune 500 list today, and it will tell you everything you need to know about what a practical education should look like. A practical education should get down to the deepest skills that humans have needed for a thousand years, teach those thoroughly, and, and I don't know what the, I, I will be dead when most of our students are my age at 57. And I don't know anyone including very prominent business leaders, military leaders, and government leaders that I've worked with, who can tell me what the workplace in the United States will look like in 50 years. That would be like going to my grandfather, uh, who lived through the first pandemic, the great influenza epidemic, and saying to him, oh, by the way, young man, by the time you're having children, the United States will be the dominant global power, Britain will be in retreat, and uh, the whole world will be look like this. Uh, no one knew that. Uh, and so we're trying to prepare them for uh, the deep things, the eternal things that actually are the most practical things. So uh, when I talk to someone who only cares about the practical things, I can say, look, here's good news for you. Uh, I'd rather make souls fit for paradise. I'm trying to produce saints for the kingdom of God. I'm trying to make sure that Orthodox parishes are full when I die. <laughs> I'd like to have a funeral that people come to and I would like to not die soon. So <clears throat> in 20 years, 30 years, you know, who will be in the church? I'm trying to produce uh, those people. That, that's my main mission. But here's the good news. You can do well by doing good. We're going to do this good thing 
uh, support the church, support Hellenic or Orthodox culture, uh, the Orthodox cultures of Syria, of Lebanon, of Palestine, of Russia. We're going to do that. We're going to bring those things to bear. Uh, and we're going to make saints, we hope. Uh, that's our ambition. But here's good news. That turns out to be enormously practical because it's God's world. He made it. And if you play by God's deep rules, uh, most of the time it will work out well. Notice, though, if it doesn't work out well. If 50 years from now, I should have been preparing people for, and God forbid, a reduced nation, a fractured republic, uh, an economically declining republic, that again, the deeper skills, reading well, writing well, thinking well, being flexible mentally, those will be the ones that are in demand. I mean, imagine teaching someone uh, to work for the emperor right when the empire fell. Uh, that's not a practical skill. But imagine the person had received a classical Hellenic Orthodox education. Their skills were in demand all over the world. Why St. Constantine? Seems like from oh. our conversation that St. Basil would have been a great fit, or maybe yeah. St. Justin the philosopher. Uh, I get asked that question a lot, uh, and there are really profoundly good reasons, which I'll give you in a second, but partly because it irritates all the right people. It's the name of school, St. <laughs> Constantine. Uh, people who don't like the name. Uh, immediately know they won't like our school. Uh, the second truth uh, that's a little less, I mean, that's kind of true. That is one reason we named the school this. Uh, you want to help people select, right? Uh, if you have a very generic name, like, I don't know, Holy Trinity, wonderful name. Uh, but are you Orthodox? Are you Catholic? Are you Episcopalian? What kind of school are you? If somebody named a school that's relatively new, St. Constantine, that just says a lot about what's going on at the school. Uh, the second truth, though, that's more profound, yeah, I, I hope, is this. It's just orthodox. Uh, it immediately communicates uh, to our city that this is an orthodox school. Uh, there are many saints. I mean, St. Basil is a saint for many communions uh, for good reason. Uh, and so you could end up with a school, uh, you know, Episcopal, uh, Episcopal school named after St. Basil. So St. Constantine really communicates something. But here's a deeper reason. Um, St. Constantine got the big things right in the course of his life. Uh, imagine you're in the west of the world, you're in Britain, and you're going to, you need to become to survive Roman emperor. But this is a losing game. Rome is indefensible, it's a sinkhole of cost, people try to move the seat of government a little north or to a place like Ravenna, but there's Rome, the kind of giant sucking problem. You can't defend it, uh, it gets sacked. Uh, it's How can you be Roman emperor? Uh, somehow Constantine could think outside the box and realize that he could be a Roman emperor without Rome. And so to construct a new Rome, the Minas Tirith of the ancient world, right, behind whose long walls uh, civilization survived for a thousand years is to uh, become the kind of flexible thinker leader that we really need right now uh, inside the, this republic, this God-breathed republic. We need people that say, what does it mean to be an American when such and such a thing is true about the world? Uh, how can we rethink this? And Constantine's a good example of that. And of course, Constantine got the biggest thing of all right he realized that for Rome to survive, he needed to build around the truth of Christianity. Now, it's easy enough to criticize Constantine because nobody handed you, I, you're the emperor and you decide, I, I'm going to become a Christian person. Well, what does that even mean? I mean, everybody then surrounds you and tells you what it is to be a Christian, whether they're a good bishop or a bad bishop. Uh, you become a magnet for everybody's attention. Sure. And there was no manual that they handed you that said, here, here's how you're a Christian and emperor. So other than quitting immediately, once you decide you're a Christian, what do you do? Uh, and so in some ways, we don't get it. I don't want to get into the details of like, you know, was he a great emperor uh, in 15 different ways? Why was he baptized at the end of his <clears throat> life? I, I, I know all the things that are said about that. But I, I want to pull back and say, look at these two big things he got right. I mean, we don't think about Winston Churchill because of his mistakes during the First World War as uh, First Lord of the Admiralty. What we think about Winston Churchill is that of all people, he recognized the grotesque evils of the Nazis. And almost alone, 
uh, thundered and kept England awake enough and some other people awake enough to make sure that Hitler didn't conquer it, which is a near thing, right? All of Europe. Uh, and so uh, with Constantine, these two big things he got right. Now imagine this. Imagine that instead of producing a singular Constantine, because we're not an empire anymore, we developed a republic of Constantine and Helens, uh, a republic of people who thought outside the box, who got a lot of details wrong because, I, I don't know, Father, you probably don't. Priests don't make mistakes. I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor. I know better than this. But, uh, you know, we all make mistakes. We get the details wrong. Uh, we go left when we should have gone right. We go right when we should have gone left. Uh, we say something stupid, which I'm sure I've already done here. But if I can get the big thing right, if I can embrace um, freedom, liberty, uh, if I can be a person who is deeply committed to the faith, not in a superficial way, uh, but in a real way, then I hope just like my children would judge me. I have adult children now, and I can get a pretty good list of the mistakes I've made. But I hope that perfect love uh, covers uh, all multitudes of mistakes and that that's what they recall. And so can we produce in this school, in schools all over the United States, in every airport city of the United States, a society, a republic of Constantine and Helens? And if we can, then the mistakes, it's not that they don't matter. Right? That's why you have a father confessor. But they won't matter to our republic. And we'll see a great renewal uh, of what God has given us here. The parallel to the church is beautiful, as we understand, because none of us are perfect, only Christ was. That's why the church exists as his hospital, as St. John Chrysostom yes. spoke about. And uh, as much as the church exists to provide healing, the experience of Jesus Christ, to everyone who realizes that they've made mistakes in their life, this beautiful school now is existing to help cultivate young people to be thinking individuals, it seems, from what you've spoken about, that, because that's going to be a more enriching, more edifying that's life. That's right. And we picked a saint who had to live in a very difficult world, yeah. in a realm that was falling apart, who is a secular figure, uh, who made mistakes. I mean, you don't read the life of St. Constantine and think, wow, I'd do exactly, in every case, I would make exactly the same decision. Sure. Uh, yet, when you look at Nicaea, I mean, we could list other accomplishments than the ones uh, I've listed. You, you see again and again a person who is in a horrible situation, trying to be some kind of Christian and a Roman emperor and make decisions to keep an empire alive that's dying, clearly, that's fragmenting between East and West, uh, who somehow does it, somehow succeeds. Uh, we would not be having this conversation. There would be no classical education. There would be no Oxford. There would be no Cambridge. There would be uh, nothing like what we're discussing if Constantine hadn't moved the great city, the imperial city, to the east and placed it on a foundation where, uh, with ups and downs, it could survive not just a thousand years, but by planting out of it the great you know, Eastern Roman or Byzantine, term I'm not thrilled with, commonwealth in places like Romania and Bulgaria and Serbia and, you know, greater Greece uh, and Russia, uh, that this would go on and then spread into the west of the world and become successful, that these documents that we're talking about, including the New Testament, would be preserved. There's a great myth, of course, that Christians uh, burn documents, that we were always purging things like libraries. Uh, to the contrary, Almost nothing would exist if it weren't uh, for the Greeks, uh, the great Christian Greeks who preserved all of Plato. We have everything Plato ever wrote because they cared so much about preserving it. We actually have fewer of some of the fathers than we would all like uh, because sometimes they preserve Plato too carefully. Uh, and so this great gift uh, that Constantine and then the successors to Constantine gave the world is not just inside the church. So. We will produce vocations here. In my last program, I think at one point, I had five former students at St. Vlad's looking to become priests, uh, for example. I've sent uh, students to all the seminaries, former students. But, you know, most of us go and work inside the secular work environment. You know, what does that look like? How do I make the right choices? Uh, human resources may not be a friend to a traditional Christian 
in a plant. How do I, like Daniel, who survived working with the eunuch of Nebuchadnezzar, a horrible pagan tyrant who forced Daniel to learn astrology uh, and other pagan nonsense, I mean, real nonsense, I'm talking about Plato and Aristotle here. Uh, how, how do you be a faithful Christian? And so that's one reason we pick St. Constantine, but it's another reason when I talk to people, I often say, in the book of Daniel, I think the most important verse for our school is the last verse of the first chapter. And if you look it up, you would think I made a mistake because, and this is off of the top of my head, but the verse is very short and it reads something like this. And Daniel stayed in the court of the king until the time of Cyrus, something like that. It's uh, all these things, the fiery furnace and you know wisdom that comes from God. Surely you meant that. No, the greatest miracle of Daniel's life is that God gave him the mental flexibility, the education, to survive as a saint inside a horribly pagan context for decades. And if you look at the mir number of miracles in the book of Daniel, is it four or five? Uh, you know, one every 15 years or something? I mean, he went on and on and on. Uh, and that's who we need to produce, a society of people that can endure and then hopefully bring revival uh, to our republic. Yes. Could you speak for a moment about the uh, the impactful book that you've authored, oh. um, and and share with us a little bit about that and and how it helps to cultivate not only within students but for anybody who is blessed to be able to engage it, uh, this thinking person by looking back at history. Yeah, I, I I've authored several books. So do you mean when Athens met Jerusalem? Yes, sir. Uh, it's my I worked the hardest on that. My kids grew up uh, while I was writing it, and, and maybe it doesn't show. Uh, but I really wanted to get it right. Uh, I have uh, I spent uh, 25 years, and I, I thank God for uh, Professor Al Geyer of the University of Rochester. Long after I graduated, he would come to every school I worked at, and we would continue thinking about Plato, thinking uh, about uh, what things uh, meant uh, inside of the Christian context. Uh, he's a secular person, but he was happy to have these discussions with me. Uh, and that began to gestate inside of me. And what I wanted to do is say, how did this great gift of philosophy, uh, when the church inherited it, what, what did it do? What is it? What should we know about it? Uh, and so I didn't pick the subtitle. Uh, some people often criticize it in other religious communities because they, they'll say, well, this is all Greek and all philosophy and not much Jerusalem. Uh, when Athens met Jerusalem. Yeah, it's an attempt to introduce Athens to church people. And I, I would like to believe that Greek people know Plato and Aristotle, but I'm going to suspect that like all Americans, uh, we know the names, but we don't know the profound nature of the gift that they handed forward to the church and that the church picked up and used where the church could and discarded uh, when the church could not and how that helped produce uh, modern science, uh, Republican forms of government, it's a Latin word but a Greek idea, uh, and international law. Uh, so many things, the hospital systems that we uh, used to defeat the pandemic, uh, all these are the gifts of Greek philosophy as handed to the Christians who heard Paul on Mars Hill in Athens. And so one way to think about the book is uh, from Athens uh, to Antioch to Alexandria to Holy Aksum in Africa with you know King St. Caleb, uh, the great uh, monarch. Uh, this is a global phenomena that penetrated the whole earth and set us up uh, for so many of the good things that we have today. And if we lose that heritage, if we don't understand our roots, uh, we will die. Uh, there are horrible science fiction stories that need to not become fact about civilizations that know how to use an iPhone. They become highly skilled at using an iPhone, but they no longer remember how they work. And so slowly the technology turns off because they lack the ability to maintain it or even innovate on it. You know, 20 years ago this phone didn't exist. Right. 20 years from now, it may not exist either because something better will have come along or, God forbid, 
we will have in this country so lost our technological prowess, so farmed out uh, our engineering uh, abilities, our critical thinking, that we'll have lost that. You know what would be worse than that? It would be worse if the Orthodox Church, which is the repository of all these great documents, and kept them uh, with Orthodox people in the secular world in safety for a thousand years and knew Homer as part of their childhood education, not an honors program at a national university in the United States. If we would lose that heritage, God have mercy on us. Because I'll tell you, the world won't. Uh, you know, uh, the Greeks and the Philhellenes have always had their enemies. Uh, because nothing is so good that someone won't oppose it. And to fritter away such a heritage and expect who to save it? Who, who will save this? If not us, who? And, and so, uh, in the deepest level of my heart as I wrote this book, it was an attempt for people who are not Orthodox at all. The main readers of this book aren't Orthodox at all. I'm guessing that mostly Evangelical Christians here in the United States. It's an evangelical publisher, very fine publisher, InterVarsity Press, uh, introducing them to this heritage. Because if we don't introduce this heritage quickly, if we don't produce uh, a better version of Lord Byron, uh, the next time there's a problem, it won't be like the Greek Revolution where Europe said, oh, well, the cradle of civilization, we've got to do something about this. Uh, modern universities uh, don't take the classics seriously. Uh, they discarded it for some nonsensical set of ideas that I don't even want to bother to mention. Uh, and so if, if we don't carry this forward and begin to introduce it to other people, the purpose of the book, uh, we've sinned. We've sinned greatly. Uh, and so hopefully this book helps do that. Very basic for anyone who knows what it's about, uh, but that's the purpose. You referenced uh, <clears throat> Greek nations, War for Independence, of which we celebrate yeah. now the Bicentennial. The St. Costine School produced a, a beautiful video yes. uh, recognizing and celebrating this, and, and hopefully we'll be able to provide a link for that for more people to see. Uh, in closing, could you speak just for a moment uh, about that experience of producing that video, uh, its importance for the students to be able to participate in that, as they did, um, but also as an offering from this classical education orthodox school in Houston, Texas, which is all the way on the other side of the globe, why it was important for you to be able to produce that. It, it was important to me personally. Um, so this is a funny story. I'm not sure I've ever shared it on tape before. I've written about it. But when my first son was born, uh, my job uh, was to translate that part of, of the Odyssey, which I really would have to struggle to do again. I, in Greek, uh, where Odysseus was in the Cyclops cave. And my wife got very, very ill. It wasn't clear that she was going to pull through uh, with my, my first uh, son. And so I ended up having to stay in her room, and they wouldn't give me a bed, so I was under her bed. And if you've ever translated something in bad light, uh, and it's in a Cyclops cave, and it's very gruesome, actually. So there are words there, a circular turn of a pine log. Uh, in someone's eye, uh, and to think about that, but it was very comforting, because it's such a profound truth. I mean, the lessons of Odysseus in going home, his homewardness, uh, I will mispronounce it, so I won't bother to say it, uh, is so central to everything. It was so comforting to me. I mean, obviously it was comforting to pray and, and those things, but those deep lessons, uh, this is how you become a Philhellene, right? You have a real life experience. And so when the place that birthed this thing that became so central, and then you run into Plato and it changes your life. Uh, in many ways, as I drifted away from faith, Plato was the intermediary who brought me back to faith. And this is so common. This is C.S. Lewis, uh, J.R. Tolkien, uh, all Platonists uh, of the last century. Uh, so if we want to produce people like C.S. Lewis or Tolkien, uh, maybe we should read the classics. But if you owe that debt, then just like Lord Byron, uh, just like the great naval fleets uh, of the great powers, you want to give back. You want to honor uh, your educational, pedagogical, uh, the padea, uh, which again, I will, I'm West Virginian, attempting to pronounce Greek. What can I tell you? Uh, 
and um, that gift you have to give back. And so in many ways, uh, dominantly here in Houston, our Orthodox community tends to be uh, more Arabic, uh, Arabic, Lebanese, Palestinian, uh, Syrian, Russian, uh, some Greek uh, influence, but we're a community of Phil Hellenes, uh, right down to our non-Orthodox faculty that work here, all Phil Hellenes, because all of them have been deeply uh, blessed by the Church Fathers, like St. Basil, uh, but also by Plato, Aristotle, and here is the important thing, people pretend that when Constantinople fell, that Greek history ended, and then, and then there was a tough period, and then in 1822 things happened again. But no, there, there's 400 years of rich cultural life, of rich production of civilization, of giving uh, to Western nations the very educational systems we talked about earlier. So this infinite debt, in some ways, the Phil Hellenes of 1821, paid off. I've been told, I'm not an expert. I, I read everything I can in English uh, on the Greek War of Independence, really the Greek Wars of Independence, that the Phil Hellenes helped make it possible. Of course, the Greeks did most of the fighting and dying. Uh, it's uh, to them that Greek independence is owed, but the contribution of the Phil Hellenes was necessary. It was a necessary element. And uh, here we are in 2021. And it could be that in the future of the world, uh, Greece will need Phil Hellenes again. Uh, it could be. Uh, it would be good to produce them. Uh, and so schools like this uh, produce in people, uh, Reynolds is clearly not a Greek name. Uh, and if I went to the west side- It could of, be turned into one. Yes, I, I, I know. I said, I, I'm working on it. Uh, you know, if I went back to London, I don't know if they would take us anymore. We left, you know, 400 years ago. Uh, that's that's not my home. The U.S. is, is my home. Uh, but for any thinking man or woman, uh, their home is somewhere in Greece. Their home is in Athens. Their home is in the Peloponnese. Uh, and so this video was a small gift. We had a cake. Uh, Nikos Nikos brought us some food. Uh, we always have a party. Everything should be a party. Uh, and we celebrated the Greek Bicentennial, and we'll keep doing so, uh, because of course it was many years. So cuckoo goes off whenever I say something crazy, uh, so this is why there is editing. Though my students, my former students, cuckoo clock follows me around everywhere, and we teach college students, somebody yanked it off the wall and broke it, and uh, it's actually a pretty expensive clock, and so I, uh, poor guy, I'm not gonna fix it. And actually I had so many students complain that they missed it, that I had to fix it. So I did fix it, uh, and then when I came here to start this new project, and I posted the office on Facebook, the first, I think the first comment, or very close to it was, where's the cuckoo, where's clock? The cuckoo clock? So because it's so crazy. Uh, but anyway. Well, this has been our blessing. We've been here exploring the St. Constantine School, beautiful offering here in Houston, Texas. Been able to learn more about the school, been able to learn more about you, Dr. John Mark Reynolds, uh, leadership here at the St. Constantine School, and we look forward to always staying in relationship. We look forward to always supporting one another. As you said, uh, our Orthodox schools, our churches, uh, not all having the same role on the team, but absolutely all on the same team. That's right. We're we blessed need, to have We you. need the church. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much.